Saturday, Sunday, Monday to go get, get him up off the floor. Okay, we'll call this uh, special workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. You have a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting and uh, I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt the agenda. So, so moved. moved. <coughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Uh, Richard, I'll turn it over to you at this time. Mayor, members of council, we'd like to begin this evening with a discussion relative to JASA and their uh, soccer program. As you, are, uh, as you will remember, a number of years ago, the city signed a lease for the use of Woodlands Park by the JASA Association. This evening, we're privileged to have with us Bob Sikloski, who has been the uh, right hand relative to JASA and a great uh, ambassador for their organization relative to working with the staff. He would like to bring you up to date on some of the improvements, and then we'd like to discuss uh, potential future leases and potential uses of other city property. So, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. When you get ready to advance the slides, just push that little button right there. Okay. And I let the record reflect that I actually gave him technical direction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Bob Chklosky, the president of Jacksonville Soccer Association. I appreciate the time to address the city council tonight. Uh, just a little bit of background. I'd like to go ahead and say and speak about our founder, Billy Joe Morgan. He worked with local officials, and he worked with New River Rotary Club to go ahead and get Woodlands Park established. This is now known as the home of Jacksonville Soccer Association. Billy Joe Morgan had a vision, and it was about developing the soccer abilities for children in our area. This vision grew. He later on became elected into the North Carolina Soccer Hall of Fame. And continuing with this, 40 years later, Jazza still holds a soccer program for the boys and girls of Onslow County. We continue to promote soccer to the benefits of the boys and girls, regardless of their ability, their race, and their economic status. We're the only full-service soccer club in Onslow County. And we are the largest. According to North Carolina Youth Soccer Association, the president's meeting that we was conducted the 27th of June, 2015. Our current membership is 1,073 members. We basically hold roughly 750 games there per season. And we have two seasons. To move along, what we're going to go into, the first picture you see up there is the slides for the kicking for hunger. This is where we have coaches come in and we offer a three-day camp to our children. They donate cans of food that we give to our local food banks. This year, we went and gave it to Northwoods Park Middle School. This is in support of Onslow County United Way Children Healthy Eating on weekends, which is known as Choose program. We donated 455 cans to them this year. We'll go to the next slide. These are the children that are coming out there. Again, it's a free camp. We average anywhere between 57 and 75 children participating in this program. Here's another shot of some of the skills that they do at this camp. It keeps constantly refining it. Another item that we do is we support Jacksonville High School in fundraising for their sports program. This is done through an uh, indoor soccer tournament that's done in, uh, every January. We also support two baseball teams and uh, softball teams for the Jacksonville Parks and Recs Department. Uh, we have community service hours for the high school students. All they have to do is come there, and we allow them to work on the fields and everything. We also provide scholarship to recreational players that can't afford the registration fee. Another thing that we do to the community is working with 
Swansboro Soccer Association, Onslow County Soccer Association. We do North Carolina's Youth Soccer Association Kepner Cup. That's the President's Cup. We invite these teams to come here and play games. According to the Jacksonville Onslow County Sports Commission, this one weekend event has an economical impact of 450,000 plus for that weekend. With this year, there was 1,800 participants and spectators that came outside of town. They rented or they purchased uh, 1,345 rooms from our hotels. Moving along, we'll go ahead and start talking about some of the upgrades that we did at Woodlands Park. This first picture here is of the new tile floor to include baseboard. We put new partitions in there that is supposed to be uh, graffiti proof. <coughs> we hadn't had that challenge yet. Uh, we've got the, <laughs> the baby changing table inside the woman's head. Now you see new paper, we got mirror and soap dispenser there. This is just another angle so you can see the full decking on the floor. The next item is the netting. This prevented a lot of balls going over the fence. The neighbors were extremely happy about this. Uh, we have two uh, nets up there. I would like to thank Jones Onslow Electric uh, Membership Corporation for helping us complete this project. This is another version of it. It's a real long net. Your next item is our real mower, which was a Toro, finally gave up after 10 years of service. It became economically unsound to go ahead and keep repairing. Last repair would have cost us about $5,000 to fix. So what we did was we went out and in Wilmington, we found this used John Deere tractor that we purchased from them. This fire uh, reel mower helps keep our Bermuda grass in shape throughout the season. These are the sprinkler systems, and to me, they're more than that because we have 21 sectors out there, a total of 250 sprinkler heads. We've all replaced them with... Um, new high capacity one so it's reaching out there a little bit more and it's more water efficient that we have from the well system out there. Before I continue on with this next slide, we have a working relationship with Williamsburg Plantation, the Homeowners Association. What they have done is their little field there, they let us use that. We have a memorandum of agreement. We moved our U7s and U8s out there. So they now have practice areas and two game fields to do. Along with this, they have a new restroom. Now, before he goes there, let me interject this. You'll recall the original lease was for 10 years. It expired in 013. You approved a three-year extension for that that expires July 1 of 16. There were conditions that you placed upon this. Here is the status. The fence has been installed, as you've seen. The current restrooms have been upgraded, as you requested. The concession facility has been changed so it meets the health department standards, and the installation of the new restrooms has not yet occurred. Technically, that item was supposed to have been completed by July 1 of 2015. Bob contacted us, talked about some of the maintenance issues that they were having relative to the mower especially, and their lack of funds and the prioritization, we agreed that, uh, although I suppose we should have brought that back to you, uh, technically uh, this one item has not been completed, but they still have roughly eight months in which to do that. Now, the 17-acre Williamsburg site, Bob, here it is. This is our hopes. I would like to thank John Parker's associates to, for providing this detailed uh, picture for us tonight. Um, you can see we have four fields. Again, Williamsburg Plantation <coughs> offered us the means because Woodlands Parks has reached its maximal limits as far as people there and parking. We just can't fit no more people in there. The head, the new head facility 
was to support the extra field that we were going to try to build at Woodlands Park. But we just understood that you can't pack that many more people there. So reaching out to Williamsburg Plantation helped us with that one item. This, what you see in front of you, is the 17 acres at Williamsburg Plantation to where we could fit four fields. You see that we have a parking lot there and we will go ahead and make a new restroom facility there. With the growth of our organization, we're really hoping to go ahead and get this and one of these fields having lights. We have worked with the city on providing lit fields for us to practice at night. That's all our classic teams. And we've also rented Onslow Pines from the county to help support this. We have one sponsor that has one field up there in the Hubert area. So there's a need for lit fields in this area. Uh, we feel that this would be a good thing. It would help us bring more income into the area if we could go ahead and get this accomplished, if approved. Short of the discussion regarding the uh, Williamsburg property, do you have any questions uh, relative to the Woodlands operation and the lease of that particular facility? I have a question in regards to the recreational program. What growth, did, can you share some numbers on your strictly recreation growth? We are still a 60-40 club, so 60% 60 of our 1,073 people are recreation. We have just made a so new... Five to 600 are still rec, which has sort of been the number for some years now. Is that about right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so primarily your growth is in... And I'm obviously, you know, I've been around this for a little while. Um, and I've looked into this pretty hard. The growth is coming from your classic program. Our classic teams have been uh, increased from right. seven right. from last year, but there's still a lot of growth. Like with our U4 program, it's a brand new program. Mm -hmm. We have 45 extra children in this program right now. Well, the reason I bring that up is because I, I received some calls uh, actually today, and I think maybe Bob did as well. And there's some concern with some of your parents that in the youth programs, you guys are filling slots, but you don't have coaches for them. And that they're still waiting for coach assignments, they don't have coaches, and they feel that some of the focus has shifted to the pay-for-play program and moving away from the recreational side of it. Um, that's what was relayed to me. And Bob, I think you may have, they said they called you. I don't know if they did or not. Yes, they did. Just sure. that's where my concern is, is because Jazz is, when you talk about Billy Joe, Billy Joe's heart was in recreational soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been through, you know, I was a volunteer for 15 years. You know, I've got a lot of mowing time on, the, on that place. <laughs> um, so I know the program very well. And there's a big concern that the play for pay is being focused on more than the recreational and not growing the youth recreational side of it. And, you know, coaches are being paid, so you're not being able to, to, to fill the need of the volunteer coaches, which is the <coughs> recreational side. So I have a little bit of concern with your growth and what you're asking for today and, and the real purpose of it. Is it for recreation or is it for the play, pay-to-play program? It's for both, sir. And what the, what the parents don't realize now is through the state, all coaches have to be risk managed. They cannot contact a player. They cannot practice with a player, even one, unless they have their risk management card. But that's always been the case, Bob. No, this is new, sir. Okay? They must have that card. Every coach, we have at least an assistant, the coach, and a team manager that gets risk managed through the state. If they do not wear that card, this is, you know, fairly new. You're talking three years to where they must wear that visually before they could be with that team at practices and at games. 
our whole thing is is that we're a volunteer organization. We're a 5013C nonprofit. But our strength is when I start our meetings with the coaches meeting, I commend these people for volunteering. Right now, I have staff members that are looking at the rosters on that team and looking for coaches, asking a parent to coach the team. We don't have a pool of coaches that go for all the programs. We have to find them. Okay, a lot of times myself or other staff members step up and we'll, we'll coach a team. I used to coach three teams at one time. But we need more involvement for the parents to go ahead and supply these coaches. Especially well, and that's, I guess that's why I, I bring this up, because after speaking with these parents today and yesterday, you know, their concern is that the leadership is trying to grow when they can't even fill the needs of what they have. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. The coaches cannot, because I've been filling out emails to all these parents saying until the coach is cleared, they can't make contact. As soon as we identify a volunteer coach, we will make contact. I asked them to give me at least three to five days on this. Now, I can't say how fast the risk management system works. What, what is the risk management system? Okay, basically... Each volunteer board position fills out on the NCYSA uh, data sheet. Um, it gives your driver's license and they do a background check to find out if you're able to work with children. Okay. okay you have any felonies, you can't, mm -hmm. you know, there's... That's so they run this background thing. check, give it back to NCYSA, then they forward it to us. I usually get an email. This person cannot be here, cannot coach. Or I have had them come back to where this person cannot deal with any type of funds. You know, they could be a coach, but they can't do anything with funds. Do you have a, do you have a, a shortage of coaches in the, in the rec department at the present time? We have a shortage in the rec, and we have a shortage also in the select program. Now, what we also do is we have a program every Friday we run for eight weeks. It's a free clinic for all recreation players to come to. We average anywhere from 40 to 75 children at that time, and they get taught by classic coaches in our doc, which is our director of coaching. And they go through a different type of skill set to help develop their skills. And again, this is free for every child in our recreation program. Perhaps I should know this, but what is the play for pay? That's okay, what he's referring to is our some of our classic coaches, they get paid to go ahead and train their team. They That's usually all. get about four four months each season. Also it also it also talks about the, the the children that, that play in that, uh, you know, you have to travel, you have to go pay uh, hotel, food, and so forth, because uh, you play a lot of games out of town. It's so. more of a revenue stream right. than, than recreation. Recreation, you pay a $50, I'm not sure what the current, one-time registration and your kid plays for the season. Mm -hmm. And you basically play in the county here. Mm -hmm. You have volunteer coaches, there's no other fees where classic travel is, you know, pretty heavily funded by the parents or are you four through you six play only internal jazz teams so they pra uh, they practice and they play games at woodlands park are you seven and you eights are over at williamsburg plantation right now and we just incorporated the last two years to where dixon soccer club and swansboro soccer club we do interleague play so we set two weekends aside to where Jazz will go to Swansboro, Swansboro may come to Jazz or go to Dixon, and we mix it up like that, round robin. All that is no score, no wins, no losses. It's about developing the children. Mayor and Council, what we'd like to do is really divide this into two components. Number one is to give you the update on the current lease that will expire roughly one year away. 
we as a staff have reviewed what they are doing. We feel comfortable. We have not identified any additional physical things that we would like them to do under the current lease. Likewise, we will begin a process uh, probably three or four months from now to bring back to you a new lease for Woodlands. What we're asking you to do is think over the next several weeks, visit the facility. If there are things that you want to see JASA accomplish at that site <coughs> as part of a condition for a new lease, we need for you to let us know, and obviously we would need sufficient time for JASA to know so that they could look at the financial implications. I would also say to you that uh, we do need to negotiate a new lease with them probably February or March at the latest. That way it gives everybody an opportunity to look at the financial issues. So. Uh, do you have any questions regarding the current lease conditions and what they're doing at Woodlands? How many acres is Woodland? It's roughly 17 acres, sir. It's about 16 usable acres where the fields are. Okay. And how many fields does it have? It has two U13+, plus, two U12, uh, U12-11, um, two U10, U9s, a U6, a U5, and a U4 field there. I'm assuming those 10? are different size fields. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The U13 plus is roughly uh, 110 by 70, and that would be yard, sir. One of the other things, I know you have visited that park, because of topographic and drainage issues, uh, and also because of simply the, the physical dimensions of the property, uh, there are certain limitations that are just built into that site. While you have 17 acres at uh, Williamsburg, I would say it's a different 17 acres. And the reason why is because the dimensions are different, which allow you to lay out more fields and larger fields. But more importantly, the Williamsburg site is generally flat. There's only about a four-foot elevation change from one end of that property to another, whereas on the Woodland site, uh, there are probably 15 to 20 feet elevation changes. So uh, again, the first part is to uh, ask you to think about any conditions that you may want the staff to negotiate in the current lease for Woodlands. A totally separate issue is, of course, what do we do with the 17 acres at Williamsburg? Uh, this 17 acres was donated to the city by the developer of Williamsburg. It was donated without any conditions other than the fact that it, in other words, there are no deed restrictions on it. The city could, in fact, sell the property if you want it. And I would disclose to you tonight that I've had a church contact us asking to buy a portion or potentially all of it. We're not recommending that. If we are going to look at disposing of the property, there is a process you would have to go through or the city would go through, and that's to get appraisals. At this particular point in time, I would say that we should hold the property. We should continue to analyze what our options are. I would also say to you that uh, I would not personally favor final decision is obviously yours, a development plan that would require circulation through the residential neighborhood to get to the parking facility. For example, in this graphic, you'll notice at the bottom uh, left side, you're actually accessing the park through the residential neighborhood. You may not uh, be able to see it, but at the upper left of the uh, property, that is the future uh, right-of-way for Williamsburg, I'm sorry, for Western Boulevard when it is extended. So, a, you know, this is just a concept plan. So anybody in, who lives in Williamsburg who's looking at this and may live in one of those houses right there, uh, nobody is suggesting tonight that council's being asked to, to approve a plan that would bring traffic right through their front yard. If you are interested that is a completely separate lease. It would be a completely separate negotiation. Let me back you up just a moment. The, 
with the uh, current lease that uh, in the proposed possible proposed lease that Jazza has on the current site, current site on, on North off Northwoods Drive, does the city have any responsibilities? With those parks at all, one shakes their heads yes, one shakes no. Outside the fields, outside we the fields, maintain the playground. There's a trail that uh, goes around from uh, behind the school's entrance and comes out behind the uh, Drayton Hall area over there. So there are responsibilities over there for the city, yes. But as far as the fields, the restrooms, the concession stand, the city has no responsibility for that. That's spelled out in their lease. But that, those areas are open for other people to use too, right? Yes, sir. And one of the issues that, that did arise, and Bob was good in helping us work it out, was the utilization of the fields when soccer is not occurring and, and practices are not scheduled. Because it was, I do not believe it was the intent of you when you extended this lease to give them sole and exclusive right of a city asset. And the new lease spells that out, I think, very plainly. What's the uh, likelihood of uh, completing the bathroom new, new facilities by, by the lease expiration? It, there, with the um, slim to none. With the amount of money that it would cost, and we really don't see the need of building a new one for a place that, you know, like I said, right now we got Williamsburg with the extra restrooms. The current restrooms are sufficient for the people at that place right there. The uh, the requirement for the extra restroom was that was that based on I guess I'm asking the city on this one. Was that based on current usage or was that what was what was the reason behind requiring additional facilities? We actually feel and and I understand Bob is there every day and I'm certainly not. We actually feel that the current facility is under. Uh, is under restroomed, if there is such a term, <laughs> that there is a need, given the number of people that are out there on a busy Saturday, that there is a need for more restrooms. Now, that's something that, uh, you know, we, we looked at that when we discussed the three-year extension, and that's why we put it in there, is the fact that given the current utilization, there are not enough restrooms there. Is there a code uh, that, that would would govern a state state building code that would govern that? We can research that and see. Do y'all, Susan, do you know? I, I do not believe there are. No, sir. We'll, we will we'll find that inspections. Answer. We can check with inspections, so. Yeah, because originally we were looking at it, that additional field on the original 10-year plan of creating another large size field there. And that's where we're feeling we we're really going to need another restroom there. Where, where is that? That would have been on the back side of the park, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to blow it out, less to say, but uh, there's like a, I think John said 150 truckloads of dirt we would need to level out that the uh, doctor was mentioning. That it's very unlevel on the back side there. We were going to put the restroom right by the corner there by the gray shed close to the parking lot so it has access. Yeah, you know, the staff's difficulty with adding another field is you're not adding additional parking. Uh, you know, that community has an impact already. I mean, they're, while the police department and volunteers with JASA do a good job of trying to keep people off those residential streets from parking, uh, technically we can't issue tickets unless we paint the curb and we didn't feel like we wanted to do that with police personnel issuing tickets every Saturday. So really, from our standpoint, uh, we would not be in favor of building another field at Woodlands unless you find a way to expand the parking. That's why uh, any additional fields for JASA or anyone else, uh, we're going to have to look at other locations. Richard, just to clarify, the property in Williamsburg was a recreational dedication yes. pursuant to our subdivision ordinance that the developer did. So there, that restriction does apply to it now. That doesn't mean that it cannot be sold. But if it is sold, then those funds would have to be uh, allocated for recreational uses 
in as close a proximity as possible, maybe the comment. Yes, and, and uh, we'll come to that again in just a minute. Any other questions regarding the current JASA lease? Okay. Let's talk a second about the uh, Williamsburg property. Uh, as uh, Mr. Carter mentioned, this was a requirement of the subdivision regulations. There are no deed restrictions on the property. However, because the property was generated in the ownership of the city as a subdivision requirement, it is my opinion, it's not a legal opinion, uh, that I think John would concur, that if you did dispose of this property in any use, for example, if you sold it to JASA, or if you sold it to someone else for some other use, that those funds would have to be set aside for recreation purposes somewhere in the city because it was the property was generated through that subdivision requirement. I would say to you that uh, uh, several, probably a year ago now, I had a home developer contact the city wanting to know if we were interested in selling that property. I told him that I did not think we were. Uh, we've also had a church contact us recently uh, suggesting that they would like to buy a portion or all of it. Uh, we made no commitments on that, and to be quite frank with you, I would not recommend that, uh, not at this time. I think you need to give further consideration as to how you want to support JASA. I also want to state for the record, there are no city funds that I can envision for at least five to seven years that are going to be available to help develop this park, whether it's for soccer or whether it's for playground equipment. So if JASA is looking to entertain this as a lease facility, uh, I will say to you, of course, you're the ones who decide how the money is spent. I cannot project any city revenue being available. So any lease of this property for this use the full expenditure for developing that would fall, at least it would be a recommendation out of my office, that it fall upon JASA and not the city. Uh, definitely would have to be a cost recovery there if, if that was to be developed for recreation for, for purposes of JASA using, you know, putting fields in there. I don't know if they're in any position to do that or not. We, sir, we would have to look for some of our sponsors. A lot of... Uh, Construction companies around here may provide help and stuff like that, but it, it wouldn't be a, a turnkey operation within a year or two. It would take some time. The lease, the lease on the other uh, site is fee-free, correct? That's correct. There is no fee for it. There are just simply conditions and requirements. Any other guidance or a, discussion? A, I got another phone call today. Um, <laughs> Regarding the uh, the Williamsburg, you may know where this is coming from. The impervious uh, areas out there. Um, this is my call. Hmm? I got it, but I you missed get, it. Yeah. I okay. It. Same call. Um, concern over um, putting a parking lot in there would would be considered impervious, and uh, supposedly Deaner has not is not going to allow any more impervious areas. Uh, flow into the current detention ponds in that area. True or not, I don't know, but uh, that's something for, for them to be aware of and the city to be aware of, too, I think. Just to Yes, I, I think we all got the same telephone call, and uh, uh, my response was this. Uh, any development there, we would have to assume that on-site retention would be part of the development plan. Therefore, if someone built soccer fields, they're pretty pervious. If someone built a parking lot, then you're going to have to have space to build a retention facility. But I would agree, uh, or I would, I would state the position this way, that if and when the 17 acres are developed, we have to assume that part of that property is going to have to go to meet the stormwater requirements. That, well, of course, you would have parking lots and maybe a roof over a picnic shelter or something like that, but other than that, you would have pervious surfaces. Right? That's correct, and you can also do, uh, you know, as you know from Jacksonville Landing, uh, there is now pervious, meaning porous, there is pervious concrete you can use. 
plus there are other techniques that uh, can be used that will reduce the amount of impervious uh, surface area. That concludes this portion, unless Bob has other concluding comments or you have other questions. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. Thank you. What we'd like to do, uh, if you don't mind, is uh, move down to item number four, which is the water tank, and then right after uh, six o'clock, we should have members from the police department joining us to talk about uh, the synthetic drug issue. Uh, Deanna Young, it is all yours. Thank you. Good evening. So um, as a reminder, we have an asset management program, and um, this asset management program includes maintenance, management, and upkeep of our elevated water storage tanks. And this year, we have the opportunity to bring on a new tank, and we've identified the downtown tank. Because it's such an iconic and very visible structure, we wanted to consult with council regarding what color we should paint it. State red. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. Half red, well, half orange. Let's move on to the next okay, the we're done. Of time. Was that a motion? <laughs> it dies for lack of a second. Uh, <laughs> so um, the downtown uh -huh. tank was originally painted blue to match the big J in the old city seal. And this color also ties in the colors of the lampposts, the benches, and the fixtures. So we've had we've heard issues that um, regarding potential water quality because of the dark color blue. Um, however, this tank turns over about twice a day, and therefore this really isn't an issue on this particular tank. And our other tanks are currently painted gray with blue letters. Um, this is actually the tank over at um, Ellis. This is the one you can see off the bypass. And this was a visual representation if it, if we did paint the downtown tank our that gray color. But would that look all that good with those dead buzzards hanging? The buzzards will be painted to match and the color coordinated with the... Uh, we can make that happen, yes. So um, this is a visual representation of it, uh, gray with blue lettering, and this is if we decided to go... Um, match the current city blue with the gray lettering. So one of the issues though that we have is if we paint it the dark blue, our consultants recommending that we use a higher gloss sheen. Um, this will help mitigate some of the issues that we've had in the past. Um, but this higher sheen is a higher cost. It would in, in an additional $43,000 over the eight years of this contract. So it's really only about $5,300 um, if we chose to go with the darker blue. What's, what's, what's the reason why I need gloss sheen? Um, it's actually to protect the paint. Um, if you're very familiar, I'm sure, with the downtown tank now, if we use our current overcoat system, there's a very high probability that in the eight to 10 years that that's what we're gonna get again. This higher quality sheen actually um, gives it a little bit more protection. It's a higher strength. UV, UV yes. protection. And if you have been down and looked at the current, uh, at the tank in its current condition, you can very clearly see that uh, the UV has impacted mm -hmm. and that, uh, that sealer or final coat, which is basically a clear coat, if you think of it as like a car clear coat, uh, it has deteriorated uh, substantially. That was one of the reasons why we selected this tank as our next tank. Technically, it wasn't in the, in the cycle for the next, but because of uh, concerns with color and the fact that it is looking uh, rather dismal, uh, that's why we brought this forward. I like you the know. blue and white. Well, I have a definite opinion on this because I asked my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and she said the blue is not, not doing it. She said she thought that they should be a color you found in nature, but I don't think we're going to put tan or green or anything like that. But so she thought the gray was a better choice. I would also mention to you, and you know this from being on the Water and Sewer Advisory uh, Board, there are industrial colors that indicate certain things. Uh, green and tan are not the industrial colors that indicate drinkable water. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she did not, she took a look and she said no, it's blue. I like the blue and white. Is there a request? 
requirement for if we paint it the, the grayish uh, for a high gloss sheen? Is that the same sort of requirement or not? No, no, sir. The the lighter color paint doesn't attract and hold the the, the heat in the UV as long as the darker paint. Um, so we could at before you uh, your council item this evening is this contract, um, and the price is averages about. 35,000 I think for over the eight years each year so if, if you decided to paint it the dark blue and not apply the the over the higher quality overcoat system that the cost would be the same 35,000 if you decide to go with the higher gloss sheen then we are proposing to add and amend your agenda item to, for an, a budget amendment of an additional roughly $5,300 to execute this first year contract and I would say to you that we the that if you want the blue to stay, our recommendation is you add the additional protective coating. I don't know where I've seen this, but I've seen a tank somewhere white and it was striking. What's your consultant say about white as a tank color? We, we haven't actually identified white. We can, I mean, we can look at it. I'm sure with it being the light color, similar to the gray, it would be the same scenario. And I would, I would think just from my small experience with colors and stuff, your white's going to degrade much more quicker than gray or blue. Well, we would also, if possible, we would like to keep the tanks as, as uniform as possible. I mean, you already have, uh, what, three that we've painted the gray color or two? We have two. Our Ellis and Northwoods tank are the gray with the blue lettering, and the, the Commons tank is, um, more, is white because it's the concrete. Is it to our benefit to stay with the same color price-wise? Is, is that a consideration? Or? Again, if, if we chose the the um, the lower the lower sheen finish for the darker blue, there's no impact to the yearly cost as presented. But again, our consultant's recommendation is if we use the darker color, we really need to proceed with the higher gloss sheen, and that would be um, forty-three thousand dollars over eight years or Yearly, it's an additional fifty-three hundred dollars. Oh, I'm understood sorry. The question: what, what I'm saying is, if we decided to go with the gray versus this dark blue, the price is different. Doesn't change. Or it doesn't change. It's the same. But we don't have to go the high gloss. Correct. Option. Okay. You know, if we've already got some gray ones out there, and it's a cheaper alternative, I, I my, my vote would be to, to go back with the gray. We did contact the uh, the Marine Corps to ask if they had an opinion, because uh, those of us who uh, live close to the water tank also know that that is the approach zone for uh, the flight, uh, for the landing flight path, and uh, they did not have an opinion. They said as long as it is under 150 feet or some such number that we can paint it any color we want. That if it gets over that number, they want it orange and white. <laughs> Honestly, that's what they said. Clemson, orange and white. Mm -hmm. I thought theirs were red checkered. I don't know when I looked at them at Red and white. I don't see the benefit to the citizens of having a blue, uh, extra extra 40-some thousand to paint it blue. I think, I think if you paint it the grays, uh, I think they'd be just as happy. I'll rectify my statement too. Those are not real buzzards hanging from there. At least. <laughs> <laughs> Any other direction you want to give us? Because if that's the direction that you're comfortable with, then the agenda item does not need to be modified because your agenda item on the formal agenda is simply to award the contract, and we will uh, take the direction that we will paint it accordingly. I'll go with the gray, but. The blue actually sticks out better. That almost blends in with the sky. And if you're doing it as an advertisement, it kind of catches your attention. The blue really does. A lot of the other ones I don't even notice. But I can go with the blue. The sufficient direction? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Recently, Mr. Bittner asked a question regarding the Western Boulevard drainage project. 
and we thought that it was uh, a very good question. Almost all of his questions are good questions, just for the record. Almost all. Almost, <laughs> almost all. <laughs> but uh, we, we did ask Anthony if he would come and give you a, an update regarding the uh, intersection of 24 and Western Boulevard and drainage. So, Anthony, please. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm going to spend most of our time talking about the actual construction project, uh, but before we get into the details, I'd like to cover some of the context. Uh, namely, what are the issues that we're trying to address with the construction project? And of course, what actions have we taken over the past several years to help alleviate those issues? And how do they support the DOT project as well? The, the main concern at this location, and as a point of reference, uh, Lejeune Boulevard is running uh, east-west on the screen, and Western Boulevard is running north-south. Uh, but the main concern here is localized flooding. And I would characterize it as regular flooding, excuse me, flooding, uh, but not frequent, infrequent flooding. Excuse me, did I say that wrong? I don't think you said that right. I, I, didn't, say, I didn't say any of that right. <laughs> so regular flooding, but infrequent flooding. And what I mean by that is that it's regular enough to be a concern that needs to be addressed, but it's not frequent enough to where it actually happens every time it rains. So what we see out there is that the flooding is generally concentrated around the intersection, and then it also extends uh, to the east along Lejeune Boulevard, uh, <laughs> mainly along the commercial frontage there, and then, of course, towards the north, um, back towards uh, Liberty Drive and the Bryn Mawr area. Recent improvements, DOT installed two lateral culverts underneath Lejeune Boulevard. And the arrows there on the screen, they're just for illustrative purposes. Uh, that's not exactly where the culverts are located. They're actually a little bit further to the east where the majority of the flooding happens. Uh, but the purpose of those culverts is to basically convey water from the north side of Lejeune Boulevard, where it basically gets trapped by the road, to the south side of Lejeune Boulevard, where there's an existing drainage ditch that provides both storage and conveyance capacity. With that project, DOC, DOT also installed a 48-inch culvert that runs diagonally across Toro Boulevard to help uh, accommodate for the additional capacity that they added to drain from north to south of Lejeune Boulevard. So basically, if you're draining more water from north to south, then you also have to accommodate that water draining across the intersection here. Otherwise, we would end up with localized flooding in this area instead of along the commercial properties. The Marine Corps also completed some improvements in this area, uh, namely removal of two undersized culverts beneath the rails to trails. They actually replaced those culverts with a wooden boardwalk, which widened the, the drainage channel to improve the drainage capacity out there. And then also with that project, they, they cleared out the channel to help improve storage as well as conveyance. One of the improvements that's not shown on the screen here are the, is the improvement to Bougainville Road. Uh, they actually took out the existing culverts and, and upsized them so that the entire drainage system from basically Lejeune Boulevard to the New River has additional capacity at this point. Uh, now, the improvements on the screen here, they're mainly to address the, the flooding issues along Lejeune, uh, but they don't really address uh, the flooding concerns adjacent to Western, behind Tire Country, heading back towards the Bryn Mawr area. And all along Liberty Drive. Yes, sir, and all along Liberty Drive. That's correct. And that's why we have the U5508 project. So about four years ago, the MPO asked DOT to add this project to the TIP, and the purpose was to basically uh, revision or re, uh, reinvent uh, the stormwater infrastructure under the intersection because the control point for drainage between here and the outfall here is, of course, underneath the intersection itself. 
So uh, we work with DOT to evaluate five alternatives, and those alternatives range from basically doing nothing uh, to the alternative that was selected, which is use the existing uh, stormwater infrastructure in addition to constructing new stormwater infrastructure to help increase the, the total conveyance capacity. So the project consists of two new 60-inch culverts that would basically run in tandem along the alignment shown on the screen there. Uh, they would go underneath Western Boulevard and then underneath Lejeune Boulevard to uh, outfall the water uh, to the drainage ditch on Marine Corps property. It also upgrade an existing 30-inch culvert to a 48-inch culvert to help uh, convey water parallel to Western Boulevard uh, into the existing system, which consists of a 72-inch culvert as well as a 48-inch culvert. And, and both of these lines are in good enough condition to remain as is, but they will need to be a uh, slip line to improve longevity. So that's basically the project in a nutshell, uh, but it only represents about 50% of the overall work that's gonna happen out there. Uh, there are a number of utility conflicts that need to be addressed before we can actually do the, the stormwater construction. And really any utility you could possibly think of is, is in that location. Will this do anything to alleviate the flooding on Bryn Mawr Road itself? Not really. The purpose of this. What does that flow to right now? Not exactly sure. This you're, you mean Bryn Mawr Road or Bryn Mawr Shopping Center? Now, you know, one of the big problems we were having was over there behind Bryn Mawr Shopping Center. That Bryn what is that little place called back there? Bryn Mawr House. Those businesses back there. Am I wrong? But I've seen some uh, some severe storms where they had to post signs high high water oh, areas on Bryn Mawr Road. And stuff. Yeah. And this will this will help on the the Bryn Mawr Shopping Center, and it will help on Liberty. Liberty. Right. What it will not help though is the opposite side of the street, and I apologize the um, the area further down. Um, which was actually Mr. Bittner's question. Um, what's the creek that's further? Scales Creek. Scales Creek. Scales creek. Uh, the problem at Scales Creek, and the reason why the flooding is there, is when the DOT built the outfall that goes from Scales Creek under 24, that it is too flat. And unless the DOT goes in and literally reconstructs that section of 24, it acts as a dam. And so that, that area of Ellis Boulevard and back up through there that has the flooding, none of that is going to be impacted here. Some of the flooding that occurs actually up in Bryn Mawr subdivision will not be impacted by this. This is really a, what I'm going to call a very expensive local issue. And the other part that I'd point out is all of this work is open ditch. I mean, you can imagine, you don't jack and bore a 60-inch culvert. Mm -hmm. So when, when we get into this project, which Anthony's mm -hmm. going to show you a minute, sure. the schedule, mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about a lot of, uh, pardon the expression, pain and suffering uh -huh. that the traveling public is going to go through. Because we're going to have to, the city will have expenditures here. Uh, while it won't be a city contract, the relocation of city water and sewer lines will be a piggyback project that the DOT has agreed to award to the same contractor using the same concept that we did at Piney Green, you know, where we just have one contractor out there, not right. multiple contractors. So this is going to help, but anyone who is thinking this is going to solve Scales Creek problems, it's not. Anyone who thinks it's going to solve all the problems back up in Bryn Mawr, it is not. Johnny, come up and discuss this, please. Thank you. <laughs> I've watched this project for 18 years. <laughs> I've watched Bryn Mawr Road and Village Drive and Liberty Road and all of them flood every time we get a three or four inch rainfall event. It doesn't flood every time we get a small rain event. So if you take the top of the corner there to two 60 inch pipes and you already have an existing pipe coming out there, the two 60 inch pipes will receive an awful lot of water that used that now today is just standing waiting its turn to cross the road. I'll put it as simple as I can. But two 60-inch pipes will start 
relieving pressure all the way up to Bryn Mawr Road, to Village Drive, to Liberty Road. Those all three drain to that point. If they're draining into one pipe and now you're going to give them two more pipes, you're going to get some relief, yes. It's probably a small percentage, but you will get some relief. And that's the only thing I want to point out. Right now, you have no relief at all. So that's why we're getting flooding. The Scales Creek point at Bremar Road intersection, where Kentucky Fried starts there, all of that water goes the other way. It goes down the left side of Bremar Road toward the west. All the water from this point is at Oakwood and Bremar Road that shoots straight down toward Liberty Drive. So if that helps a little bit, you see there's a split right at the intersection. So one feeds the uh, one side and the other one feeds down to this side. I hope that helps a little bit. You did very much. Did that culvert they put under 24 that you, as the wrong elevation, did that <coughs> somewhat help? What is that, Hardison? Is that Hardison? Hardison uh, Hills? Yeah. So that's still that's a big flooding problem, isn't well, it? Well, that that is Scales Creek, sir. That is yeah. the flooding issue because of the box culvert that was put in there is just too low, and then you have a a controlling point for the waterway on the opposite side of the road, which is a, a really a high tide thing. When the tide comes in, the water doesn't go very fast, and if a rain event happens with high tide, all you get is backed up water, and I've right at the wastewater station. We've had several problems there because of high water that can't get under 24, and that's the Scales Creek uh, box culvert. And all that water is coming up all the way from Western Boulevard all the way down. Did that, uh, that kind of paint a picture or yeah. not, sir? Let's look at the schedule. So right now the, the timeline is right-of-way acquisition will begin in the fall of this year and by the fall generally mean October um, time frame and then if all goes well with right-of-way acquisition and finalizing the design plans uh, we anticipate construction to begin in the fall of 16 again in October time frame Depending on the construction method, and, and as uh, Dr. Woodruff mentioned, Jack and Boar is probably not going to be an option for us, but DOT is still considering it at this time. Uh, but depending on the construction method, we're probably looking at six to eight months in duration. Out of curiosity, try, try to tie this all together, when is the Piney Green project supposed to be completed? I'm going to get to that in just a second, sir. There is some logic behind the scheduling here. so. Um, some of that time, about half of it, is going to be dedicated to the utility relocation, and then the remainder, of course, would be the stormwater construction itself. Some considerations that we've been working leading up to this point and will continue to work on moving forward. Um, of course, the construction methodology, Jack and Boar was considered, but more than likely we're going to end up with an open cut type of construction, and that will cause significant lane closures and delays. Um, one of the things that we did consider was um, scheduling this project to ensure that Wilson Boulevard was complete, so meaning not just the interchange itself, but complete all the way to Mainside, so there was more than one point of ingress and egress to the base uh, as we begin to open up the intersection. Have they completed that? Uh, it should be completed mid to late 2016. So this project, as it's scheduled, will dovetail very well with that exercise on the base. Um, it also worked out very well because Piney Green should be completed within that time frame as well. So we're looking, the last date I saw was September of 16 for Piney Green. Is that what you're hearing? They're still saying April, but more than likely it is going to be summer to early fall before that project is completed. <clears throat> Some of the other considerations, um, as you already know, the, the TT1 gate has been recently closed to, to traffic, so all of the access to Tarawa Terrace currently funnels through the TT2 gate, and as we move to constructing this project, it's going to be an issue. Uh, as we have significant lane closures out there, it's going to be a challenge to operate that gate for both the residential and the, the, uh, the commuter traffic. 
So we're working with the base right now to help make the decision on whether or not TT2 should stay open or whether or not that should be closed during the construction process and have TT1 reopen uh, during that time frame. Is the uh, TT2 accessible by, by way of Wilson Boulevard? Yes, sir. The entire uh, Tarawa Terrace housing area is accessible by Wilson so Boulevard. It's not like your We're not cutting area. them off completely, but there are a lot of houses in there. And so you really want more than one point of, of, of ingress and egress. Mr. Bittner, I hope that that uh, addressed uh, the thoughts that you had. Thank you. Any other questions on this? If you don't mind, could we take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back with the police department to talk about synthetic drugs? Councilmember uh, Washington returned from uh, a national conference. She asked if we could make a presentation regarding synthetic drugs. And this evening, we're pleased to have the Chief Mike Unera and the Deputy Chief Patrick Trader, who are going to give you an update on this. Let's turn it over to you, please. Patrick? Oh, okay. Um, Council, yeah, we'll take a few minutes this evening, um, per Ms. Washington's request, to talk about the emergence of these synthetic drugs on, on our drug scene. And the, the first one that um, we'll, we'll speak on is uh, Flocka. Uh, it is a synthetic drug. Um, Flocka and bath salts are kind of, um, oh, I've got to control that, my bad, are kind of interchangeable. And, and this particular slide, when we talk about the emergence, this particular slide really depicts that. And you can see how quickly... Um, those particular cases with Flocka, the cathinone has, has spiked in a relatively quick time, beginning like in 2004, we have nothing, then all of a sudden the takeoff around 2010, and it's peaked, but now it's beginning to dip a little bit because there is federal law prohibiting these particular um, analog drugs that are needed to synthesize this particular drug. So, well, go ahead, Chief. If I might add, one of the things that we're seeing is this is, a, this is kind of an end-around game as far as the legal system. So, so what in, in these types of drug cases, uh, the reason that this slide is kind of important, it shows the ex es I'm going to probably Escalation. Thank you. It, it shows the, the, uh, the regular drug, and then it shows the synthetic drug. So what they're doing is they're changing the molecular structure of a drug in order to get around the criminal law. So we've seen this in both spice, we've seen it in bath salts, and we, we're seeing it now in MDMA, um, that type of drug. So as, as these drugs, as, as these chemists start to produce this drug to get around the criminal laws in our, in our country, we're, we're starting to see these kinds of problems. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead, right Chief, absolutely. Um, so continuing on speaking on, on Flocky, it's in the chemical class of... Um, what are called cathinones. Forward. Um, it's also, like I mentioned, it's also known as bath salts. Um, I'm going to progress one more slide here. Yeah, um, it's designed to mimic the effects of cathinone, and cathinone is a is a, a um, it's a substance that naturally occurs in the cat cot plant. 
um, that you see. It's a, it's a plant, it's a flowering plant that's indigenous to the Horn of Africa, um, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it's big in Somalia, and if any of you guys remember some of the, um, the stories coming out of that particular uh, area with regards to um, the civil unrest, and they had these young children that were soldiers, and they would chew this cat, and it would keep them awake, keep them functioning for long hours at a time to, to do the particular things that they were doing there with regard to that um, unrest. So, um, as I just said, it's, it's found in the leaves of the cotton chewed in some parts of the world. Um, it's categorized in the same family as bath salts. It's synthesized in the same manner. And there you'll see a photograph that kind of depicts what um, the average, um, what flocka and bath salts look like. That's, that's the common form we Go see it in. That Go back one. That, that actually caught, that was seized in, uh, in Jacksonville about two years ago. That's a, that's a photograph of, of cot that we actually seized out of a, uh, out of a shop here in, in, in Jacksonville. So this, this, this stuff is around and it is, it is being sold and it is being marketed um, in our community. How much, how much does, did that particular um, um, sample weigh and what was the street value of that? I think the street value of that was, uh, I think it was about uh, $10,000. And it was, it was it's, it's actually, it's packaged kind of like uh, in, in bundles, and uh, very similar to marijuana. And, um, and it's trafficked throughout the United States. Um, so so that, that, that's probably, I think, I think we had about... Um, I think it was about 20, 25 pounds that we that we actually seized during a during a raid of a business here in Jacksonville. I have some more information on that further on down the line too, Ms. Washington. <coughs> All right. So it, again, it's normally seen in a white or brown crystalline powder. It's also labeled in packages, um, small foil packages, labeled not for human consumption. Sometimes it's marketed as plant food, and it's been seen as jewelry cleaner and phone screen cleaner. And it's, and it's packaged this way to avoid detection by law enforcement or the average person not knowing what they're looking at. They see this full package that says, you know, uh, jewelry cleaner, and they just assume that is what it is. So if you're on the inside, then you kind of understand what it is that you're purchasing, or you can go in and say, hey, to a store, hey, can I have a package of um, jewelry cleaner? And so then that gentleman that's operating that business illegally knows what it is that you're asking uh, for. Um, what you, what yeah. schedule is that? Control schedule one. Yes, sir. Um, they're sold online um, and in drug paraphernalia stores. You may see it also labeled as Ivory Wave, Bloom, Cloud Nine, some of the names that you see there. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really up to the individual manufacturer what he likes or she would like to call her product. And again, some more um, uh, photos of what, how, this, how these things are packaged. And you can see some of them, like the one down at the bottom that's, that says Cloud 9. And that's, I, I don't, you'd have a hard time saying that's jewelry cleaner or uh, plant food. So these are the more obvious um, packaging uh, styles. You can take it orally, you can inhale it, or you can inject it. If you inject it, you simply take it and put it in with a little bit of water, much like you see heroin. And they'll take it and put a little bit of spoon, put a little bit of water, they'll put some heat to it, render it down to a complete liquid, draw it in through a syringe, and inject it uh, that way. Um, inhaled, it's just chopped up very fine, and then just snorted much like cocaine is. Um, it affects the body much like amphetamines and cocaine does. What it does is it increases dopamine in your brain in the areas where you have reward and movement. And so what that does is it gives you that feeling of euphoria mixed with the increased activity. Um, there have been cases where officers have reported the individuals that are high on bath salts or flocka have, you know, this incredible amount of strength don't really um, <coughs> respond to uh, pain compliance measures. So. Um, these individuals can certainly be dangerous. These are the these are the kinds of cases that you probably read in the newspaper where somebody actually uh, actually dies during a, an encounter with the police where they're restraining him. Excited delirium is one of the is one of the conditions that this often produces. So when the uh, officers use their tasers, when they use their their pepper spray, or when they simply just restrain somebody, sometimes it results in the, in the uh, death of the offender. 
So they beca it becomes very dangerous for that. You know, the person's pulse is very high. Their heart rate is very high. It's, it's a very dangerous drug because it's an amphetamine. And to add to what the chief was just speaking of, the common reactions of folks that have seek medical attention have been chest pain, racing heart, the high blood pressure. Those are the things that tie into the excited delirium, which makes it very physically dangerous for individuals who are, who are taking this drug. Paranoia, hallucinations, panic attacks. In prolonged use, you'll see the breakdown of skeletal muscle tissue. Um, and then, of course, kidney failure and other um, system failures in the body. And, of course, that's when you've been taking it for a quite uh, a period of time. It's much like you've seen with the faces of meth, if you've seen that popular poster where you see the, the before and the after. It's sort of along the same lines. Now, in October of 11, this is when the, the DEA got on board with this and really it really came to the forefront. And they placed the three common synth synthetic com cathinones under emergency ban while they researched it, while they looked into this um, particular drug. And those three were the um, methyl dioxaline pyrovaluron, and I practiced saying that in my office several <laughs> times, um, and then methadrone and, and methylone. Those were the three that they put on the emergency ban while they continued to research. If, if uh, um, Mayor Pro Tem, if you will remember, we worked with uh, Chapel Hill during that time to get a bill passed with, with Senator Brown to actually be a little bit ahead of this game. So we actually did pass that bill. Now, last year, I think, I'm pretty sure it was last year, Senator Brown helped us again to add some additional drugs to that, uh, or additional compounds to, um, to that list of Schedule One drugs in order to try to stay ahead of these kinds of drugs, at least statewide. Um, typically, communities like us in Chapel Hill, where, where we have a large young population, that we were the people that were seeing the, this uh, more more so than and then other communities that are that are a little bit older than us. So in 2012, President Obama signed legislation permanently banning a methadone and the uh, MDPV, um, and of course. The new law also, because in that time between where they put the things on the emergency ban, those three compounds on the emergency ban, between the time that he signed the law in 2012, we saw just what the chief was alluding to. The chemists um, began to figure out, okay, well, if I add this particular compound here, this completely changes the molecular structure of this compound, and therefore it is not on the ban list, so we can now continue to make it. So we added in the, into that law the, the chemicals that... Um, or that are similar to the analogs, much like with um, methamphetamine where you have something called precursor chemicals where those particular things are banned, it's sort of along the same lines again. And of course, um, you know, scientists, they're, they, these, these clandestine scientists, they're continuing to research ways to, again, tweak that molecular structure, have the same end product, and still create the same drug. We, we were kind of lucky. The state lab, or actually the SBI at that time, was was very effective uh, because other states had had uh, similar experiences, and they were able to get to the root of the co of the of the drug. So when you look at a drug, um, generally it has has a, a number of compounds in it, but the root compound is what causes the high or what causes whatever effect they're trying to sell. So in a lot of these drugs, we were able to get that root compound, and that's that's enabled us to be a little bit more proactive than other states where they just did the compound itself. For example, in the spice situation. The spice situation was manipulated several different times in other states, Tennessee being one of those. And uh, the, the Tennessee legislature had to keep going back and back and back. Well, our state actually learned from that and, and actually banned the root of it. And, and that enabled us to you know, we had one of the largest spice seizures in the United States at, uh, several years ago. So, so that's helped us tremendously in, in, in getting the spice off the street here in Jacksonville. So what, analogs, help me out here, are similar to derivatives of this? Yes, sir. It's, okay. it's, yeah, it's just, um, again, sort of like a precursor chemical. You can find something, a compound, that the end result is what the chief was alluding to <laughs> is the same um, root drug that, give, that uh, gives you that high, that gives you that effect. So what they did was, and to, to combat that, they said, all right, anything that's close to it, any analogs, any precursors, anything you create 
that we don't have listed here, it's it's going to count against. It's going to be illegal. To For possess. example, THC, which is what they try to manufacture in in uh, synthetic marijuana, is that that compound that makes up THC has one component in it that really is the most dangerous, or the, the 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 component that that these the chemists look for to create that high. So uh, that component for synthetic marijuana has been outlawed in that law, just that that root of, of the entire chemical compound. So when they tweak it, when they add something else to it or move it, uh, trying, to, trying to disguise it to get around the criminal law, they were unable to do that because that root is what they needed to make that high. The root is like the active ingredient. Right. So <clears throat> here's a little bit of data nationally from our National Poison Control Centers. When you look at it, 2011, you see that tremendous amount. And these, are, these are phone calls to poison control with folks that have overdosed or have, have ingested the drug that are having some type of negative effects from it. These 6,000 calls in, in 2011 and in 12, you see a dip again now. That kind of coincides with the, the signing of that bill making it illegal. So now law enforcement's got a little bit of teeth. So you get that knocked back. 2013, it's decreased. And then in 14, the same thing. And, and as of June of this year, you see where we're at with 267 calls. So we're, we're definitely that's we're making an impact there with regards to, to um, keeping that off the street. Spice, well, Chief was just speaking of, that is pretty much synthetic marijuana. Uh, this is where the, the chemists have kind of synthesized THC and have made, have made it where that you ingest this synthesized chemical, you get the same high as marijuana. Uh, it looks a lot like potpourri. It's got dry shredded plant material in it, and they add these chemicals to give that psyche, uh, psychoactive effect to them. It's sold under many names, K2. We, when we, our seizure, it was, most of it was marked K2. Uh, fake weed, Yucatan fire, skunk, and moon rocks. So you can see that um, probably many of these folks that named these drugs were probably high on that drug <laughs> when they came up <laughs> with the name. Uh, so uh, so uh, the DEA has designated the five active chemicals most frequently found in spices, Schedule One. so you can't buy them, sell them, or possess them, what Chief was alluding to, that root com those root compounds. Um, here's what was a little bit disturbing to me. Out of all the illicit drugs used in high schools uh, by high school seniors, spice is second only to marijuana. So you can see how prolific this drug was when it came onto the scene. Um, it's the easy access and the misconception that spice uh, was a natural thing, it was harmless, um, probably contributed to that. And also the chemicals used in spice are not easily detected in standard drug tests. Now, when it got to Jacksonville and we began to work with it, that's probably one of the reasons why it was so usually popular with the military personnel, because it was not easy to detect. So they could smoke this, they could get the same effects as marijuana, the next day, if they have a urine analysis, then they, they, their, their urine shows clean. So it closely resembles that. It's mainly, it's used just like marijuana. It's smoked. You can see this, this particular photograph here. It, um, if you've seen marijuana before, this is, it looks very similar too. Sometimes they mix it with pot. Sometimes they make it into a drink. So. Um, they have the similar um, experiences, marijuana, the elevated mood, relaxation, altered perception. Some of them have the psychotic effects like extreme anxiety, paranoia, and hallucinations. That comes from, because this is a clandestine legal drug, there's no quality control, if you will. So I could decide I'm going to make this, and I could go out to Walmart, buy me a bunch of potpourri, and go into my kitchen cabinet and start pulling out chemicals, dumping it in it, manufacturing it, and selling it, right? I'm just trying to turn a dollar. I really don't care what happens with the end user. So that's really contributed to a lot of the, the issues with spice. Um, the rapid heartbeat, the vomiting, the agitation, confusion, the increased blood pressure and reduced uh, supply to the, the heart. Um, there have been some cases where that's been directly attributed to uh, certain heart with heart attacks. Again, uh, back to the excited delirium. Um, this is certainly a contributor there. Now, let's look at this. This particular, similar to the other slide with the calls to poison control, I'm just going to skip down to July of this year. Already we have surpassed 
2014 with calls into poison control with folks who have ingested spice and have experienced a negative um, or had a, a bad reaction to the drug. So it is definitely something that's out there that really um, is a bad thing. Fortunately for us in the city of Jacksonville, we have had no reported overdose death through spice or bath salts. Um, we have had a couple of significant incidents. In 2011, we had a Marine who was high on spice, crashed his car into a lot of things, uh, into a business, three other cars before he was taken into custody and he was later found to be in possession and under the influence of spice. In 2011, this was the case that I think Chief was alluding to. Uh, we did a joint investigation and we seized 37,000 grams of spice with a retail value of $1,115,250 from two local convenience stores. Uh, two, su two suspects were arrested and charged with uh, traffic in that particular case. And in 2013, we had another one where we uh, worked with NCIS. Uh, 380 grams of spice was seized and one individual was charged for trafficking um, in that case. So I added heroin in because it's sort of a synthesized drug. It, it does come from the poppy plant. I think most um, everyone in here has some basic understanding or knowledge of heroin, but I wanted to include it because there has been an uptick in heroin and it seems to be having a resurgence from uh, from, from way back in the day, from in the, the 70s, 80s, it seems like it's really coming back again. Um, again, inhaled, injected, uh, snorted or smoked, you get the euphoria, the dry mouth, the warm flushed skin. If you've ever seen any of those documentaries with heroin users where they have actual, they film the actual users, you see that euphoria. They're very relaxed. They're very just lethargic um, uh, after they've uh, consumed the drug. And I included this slide to kind of show or demonstrate that uptick that I was just speaking of earlier. You can see beginning in 2001, and this breaks down in male and female. In male users, in 20, uh, from 2001 to 2013, you can see it's just steadily, steadily crying. There, there are some reasons for that. There's the, uh, we've been very successful in, in reducing methamphetamine by, by stopping some of the precursors. So methamphetamine is not near as uh, easy to get. The other thing is that um, that uh, uh, people that used abused pills, um, generally those pills became a little bit more expensive, a little bit more difficult to, to get, especially like Oxycontin. At one time, Oxycontin was very easy to get. You, I mean, you, you basically got it for anything. But now, you know, there's a registry where they're checking that, so it's much more difficult to abuse that drug. So that's really what's caused heroin to, uh, to, to come back uh, the way it has. I, I, I'm, I probably speak for the mayor. You know, when we first started our career, we saw heroin and never thought we'd see it again, but it's, it's come back, and it's come back with a vengeance. So it's, it's, it's actually more prevalent now than cocaine is. So, uh, so it's, it's becoming more and more of an issue for us. And part of the problem when we talk about, uh, you know, we've been working with the fire, uh, fire services, all of our police officers are going to be carrying uh, Narcan, which is something to, to it's an antagonist for, for, um, for heroin. Because in many cities, and we've seen it here, um, the people are overdosing on that. They're taking other drugs like fentanyl, drugs that you are used in, in hospitals to put people to sleep, mixing it with it to get a, a stronger high, and basically stop breathing. So um, we've had a couple cases in Jacksonville, and probably within the next six to eight months, all of our police officers will be carrying the, these, uh, these, um, dr this this drug antagonist, Narcan, in order to to administer it in case somebody overdoses in with heroin. It's a. Um... How would you determine? Well, it's, it, if, if the person is unconscious, if they're not breathing, they're going to administer it anyway. They are? Because there is no, there is no, uh, there's no side effects if you're not using heroin. All it does is it stops, it stops the use of opium. So morphine, heroin, or anything like that, it will stop that effect. So there's no real reason not to use it. And in the cases, you know, we've, we've actually resuscitated them using CPR, but uh, in the cases that we've had in Jacksonville, but this drug will, will make it much more effective in order to, to make sure that they don't die from, 
from using abusing these drugs. So I remember back with heroin before before there was the idea of mixing stuff like fentanyl and stuff like that. But it was you never really knew what you were. You really didn't know how how much of the quantity of drug you had. You could get you could get heroin put out on the street that was. 90% pure, you shoot that in your arm, you never get, the needle never comes out of your arm. And, and uh, you're, you're exactly right. That, that <clears throat> is the same problem that we deal with today because we don't know how. how generally, the tolerable amounts usually runs from one and a half to three percent. Anything higher than that is going to be lead, lead the, the problem. The difficult, the, well, the difficult, but the, the, the deadly part of, of heroin and, and opiates is that you, your body naturally begins to build up a tolerance so now you're taking more and more and more and more until you take so much that your body says you know what that's 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 all i can handle and then then you, you have that overdose there's no special training in terms of it it's a, it's a, that antidote is by injection no sir it's, um well you you can you can either get it nasally where it's in a vapor and you insert it you push the plunger and it inserts it into the the nose of the the victim you can also get it in like an epi EpiPen style, where it's just an injectable. It's a pre-measured dose. The officer would just stick it in, hit the plunger, and it automatically delivers the appropriate dose. There is training. We're partnering with uh, Onslow County EMS to provide that to our officers. They carry the similar product. Uh, so each officer will have the appropriate amount of training before they're deployed with that uh, with that um, narcan. It's, it's not going to be a needle. It's going to be a, a nasal. Yeah. Well, a lot of a lot of a lot of major cities. Like I was in uh, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, doing an assessment of their police department. And they have four or five hundred officers. Every officer carries one of those in their pocket because their their heroin problem has has grown tremendously over the last two or three years. So a lot of the major cities, you'll hear from them that uh, their heroin problem is just out of control. Most of it's coming from Mexico. No. Some of it's coming from Mexico. Some of it's coming from Afghanistan. So there's, it's it just depends on where it, uh, what part of the country you're in. So for us here at the city of Jacksonville, we had four overdoses in in 2014. The toxicology on those were all were opiates, um, were the cause. Um, Oxycontin specifically was that opiate that was used in each each one. So it was a pill diversion type scenario for these individuals. Um, who overdosed. Fortunately, um, we ha we've had no heroin-related overdoses in the city of Jacksonville. In 2014, this was really big for us, in 2014 we did a joint operation called Last Call and it ended up dismantling a major, major trafficking group in New Jersey, which we determined was sp sp by supplying the city of Jacksonville and Wilmington with heroin. So. Over, we seized over 5,000 bags of heroin. Uh, so it was a tremendous, tremendous win for us in, 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 terms, of, um, in terms of seizure and, and preventing that drug from um, spreading throughout Jacksonville. In, in 2014, we've had some incident reports where we had 56 cases of, of heroin-involved incidents. 43 of those cases we made arrests on. We had one case of bath salt and then seven cases of spice. And you'll see in red with the little asterisk, uh, as of 2015, we have had no reported incidents with these drugs whatsoever. So that shows us that, that our efforts um, are, are making a difference, um, keeping those drugs off the streets. I, I might add that, you know, the council approved us to do that partnership with the DEA several years ago, and I think, I think that's had a lot to do with uh, that partnership through the DEA in, in uh, Wilmington has had a lot to do with us being able to, uh, to to work on the bigger picture rather than simply the street level drugs. So that's been very, very effective for us. Anytime you can leverage the federal courts and the federal um, judicial system, that's always a boon for you because the federal level, the sentencings are much higher and they're, and they're very uh, uh, intolerant um, in those regards. Well, it gives us the opportunity just like to, to, to be able to go to New Jersey and and dismantle it from the top down rather than <coughs> simply simply trying to keep it out of Jacksonville. So um, that investment that you all made uh, several years ago, I think, has paid off in a number of different ways. I'm still, still paying dividends to this day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Was that a report?
Thank you. Ms. Washington, I know that uh, you were specifically interested in this. Are there other questions you may have on uh, what you've seen today? No, but um, the Chief and um, Mr. Str um, Strader did a fantastic job. It was just some of the conversations that was happening at the conference in Salt Lake City about Flocka being seen in various different cities, particularly in the Miami-Dade County area, um, that Flocka is making a resurgence back. And it was many council individuals and mayors that was talking about how this drug was impacting their communi um, community. So I just thought it was a good idea to be able to bring it back and have the chief and his staff to share it with us. One of, the, question to answer. One, of, one of the problems that we face <coughs> is that because it's just like we saw those packages in Spice, some of it is, is being mailed from China. So it becomes very difficult for us to, you know, because you can go on the Internet and you can search it and you can order it and it can be mailed. And if it's not, in, if it's not intercepted when it comes in this, to the country, then it's usually delivered to someone's home. So it makes it a little bit more difficult for us uh, to do that. But... But as time goes on, I think we get a little bit smarter, just like, just like tweaking that law that, uh, that we worked on several years ago. The more we learn about it, the, the better off we are. Back in the 80s when I was in service, um, there was a problem with LSD because it couldn't be detected in the urinalysis at the time, I believe. Do you all have a problem with LSD these days? Tell you, Mr. Willingham, it has been. Last time I saw LSD was when I was in Vice, and that was wow, 1997, 98 time frame. I haven't seen. We haven't seen any since. And if we, and I, I couldn't tell you 100% sure, but I know we've had no large problems or large seizures. It may be a person here or a person there, but nothing that where it's an epidemic or a problem for us here in Jacksonville. It's it's really a, a question of of manufacturing, and it's much more difficult to manufacture. It, the, um, the LSD than it is to get these other drugs when they're manufactured in China in bulk. Because they're not, it's just not the United States that has to deal with this problem. It's that, that the same problem occurs in, in Europe, it occurs in Canada, it occurs in Mexico. You know, it's, it's shipped all over the world. So um, that makes it a little bit cheaper because they, they make it in bulk. With LSD, what we, when we saw LSD being, it, it was done in labs and back rooms and things like that. So, um, you know, methamphetamines, where you can put it in a bottle, shake it up, and, and have that drug instantaneous, had really, had really destroyed the, uh, the LSD market. Is it a matter of time before it could be grown here, the flaca? Well, I think the flaca could be grown here. Uh, I don't think I don't think it I don't think it will be. I, I think our our greatest threat is is these synthetic drugs because they're so easy to manufacture, okay. rather than rather than growing marijuana, rather than. And I, I, I think we're going to see um, we're going to continue to see these manufactured drugs to be an, to be an issue. Are there any resources that you are lacking that could help your? Actually, on a state level, we've been working with the state because, uh, and they've been very good with us, um, working on on, you know, with the chiefs association to try to uh, try to be a little bit more proactive in stopping it, and just like we did when we did it the first time, getting to those root. Uh, root chemical compounds has been very effective in, in slowing this down. Mayor, I would suggest given the time that we uh, postpone the other two uh, workshop items until the next workshop, if that's acceptable to you. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And with that, then we will uh, ask if there are any other directions you'd like to give us on any of these items. Otherwise, we will adjourn. That's your call. Okay, well, we're going, we're going to recess and to a, go into a closed session we have scheduled here. That's also scheduled at the end of the regular meeting, so if you'd rather do it at that time. Is is that how much time are we talking about? <clears throat> Manager. <clears throat> Well, let's put it this way. It'll take us three minutes to tell you what we're going to tell you in closed session. Then it's up to y'all to tell us what you let's want to tell us. Let's give it a shot. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.
So I'll make a motion. We go into closed session. Second. Second. No, I need the motion.